Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time we have Monroe Patel and Dan Walsh from Red Hat, and they're going to talk to us, us about, and I'm probably pronouncing the acronym wrong, I say CREO, um, an OCI-based um, Kubernetes runtime um, that has been um, really hot and very a topical thing around containers and that world. And rather than blather on myself, I'm going to let um, Mural introduce um, himself and Dan and just kick this off. The way the session works is you can ask questions in the chat. We'll try and answer them. Um, I will probably turn everybody's video off during the demos so that uh, we don't have any um, faces in the middle of our terminal screens. But other than that, um, it's uh, pretty simplistic. And then we'll have live Q&A at the end. So without further ado, um, Mural, take it away. Uh, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Rinal Patel. So I work on the containers team in Red Hat. So I'm a maintainer of the OCI runtime specification, the run C and lib container projects. And lately I've been busy with the cryo project. Uh, yep. And my name is Dan Walsh. I uh, run the container team at Red Hat. That's the basically the team that um, does all things containers underneath the Kubernetes level. So we're we're basically in the operating system level. So um, my team manages uh, uh, you know, fixes for things like Docker, underlying storage, um, uh, pretty much everything that happens at at, at the host um, that you know something like Kubernetes or, or uh, regular container runtimes need to do, we do um, in this team. Um, so, uh, so starting out, so we pronounce it Cryo. Um, so. Uh, so cryo, it, it really stands for. Um, if you go back in history, we we wanted to build a um, a runtime, a container runtime that followed the OCI specification. So, um, and um, if you go back a couple of, uh, about a year ago, um, Kubernetes was based totally on top of Docker and the Docker daemon, and um, CoreOS had come to. Uh, uh, open up a bunch of pull requests against Kubernetes in order to support um, uh, Rocket underneath uh, Kubernetes to basically to replace the Docker daemon with Rocket. Um, and what Kubernetes didn't want to have to do was to have a whole bunch of um, uh, you know, sort of if then else statements that says if I'm using Rocket, then go down this tool chain. If I'm using Docker, go down this chain. So what they decided to do is rather than um, support a whole bunch of different runtimes, that they would specify a uh, runtime interface. And that's what the CRI stands for is Container Runtime Interface. So uh, Kubernetes defined um, basically interfaces that it needs to, when it, when it goes to run a container, it defines those interfaces uh, and it'll call into any container runtime that implements those interfaces so since that time uh, so after that happened um, we uh, Red Hat we kicked off a little project a little side project um, to see if we could implement a really simplified container runtime whose main goal was totally tied to Kubernetes so we looked at uh, what Docker is doing and what uh, with Rocket is doing and they always had um, sort of conflicting um, goals so you know there's this CLI support there's other support but but uh, they weren't really you know, totally dedicated to Kubernetes. So what we really wanted to say is that we're going to build a runtime whose only job in the world is to satisfy uh, Kubernetes um, uh, request. So if Kubernetes changes the CRI, we implement it on top of our tool. Um, if other orchestration tools come in and want to use our uh, use the cryo daemon um, they have to talk to us to be a CRI and um, and we won't add any interfaces to our daemon that aren't uh, specifically specified by Kubernetes um, lastly every pull request that comes in from Kubernetes I mean every pull request that comes into cryo um, will not get merged unless we can fully pass the entire Kubernetes test suite. So really, Cryo is is totally dedicated and, and being optimized for the Kubernetes uh, workflow. And so next slide. Yep. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the components um, uh, that make up um, um, 
cryo. So one of the uh, things, uh, if I, I actually wrote a, a long blog that talks about the evolution of containers um, on uh, opensource.com. You can go look it up. Uh, if you Google it, you find it. Uh, we talked about uh, breaking apart. So, so if you look at the tr tradition of uh, what Docker has done, um, they basically set up one big daemon that uh, sort of built all the technology into that one daemon. So if you go out and you want to uh, run a container, you, you talk to the daemon, ask the daemon to run the container for you, that daemon goes out, pulls pulls the container from somewhere, stores it on disk, um, and then uh, does some management of the storage and then launches a, a process to, to run your container underneath it. Uh, but everything is has to go through that daemon, and the daemon becomes the central point of, uh, of you know, of, it all control. And what we wanted to do is break apart uh, that daemon into sort of core components. And so we broke out uh, a few different core components. Uh, the original one that most people have heard of is uh, uh, the OCI specification, which um, allowed us to basically get down to a, a core container runtime uh, low level. And that, you know, there are a couple of examples that are run C and clear containers. And, and really what they are is the tools for just running a container. So you give me a, a rootfs and a JSON, and I'll run a container on top of it. Um, and that's what OCI uh, specification did. But we also needed two other things to, in order to run containers for Kubernetes. We needed storage, so we needed a way to take take a um, uh, an image and actually put it onto disk. And, and so what we re originally did is we started with uh, sort of what we had done for Docker and building out the uh, storage for Docker and pulled that out into a separate package. And that's stored on the kidhub.com slash container slash storage. Um, and we started developing uh, technologies under there. And we wanted, what we wanted to do is actually move all the locking and all the uh, controls out of a centralized daemon and onto, onto disk. And so that's what GitHub's container storage and then the secondary part of running containers is uh, you know, how do I pull an image? How do I pull it back and forth between container registries and my host? And so we broke out that into another um, separate uh, Go, li Go library called uh, GitHub Containers Image. And um, so what we've done there is we're basically, well, we have engineers and uh, people contributing different ways of moving images around. So images can move back and forth between container registries and Docker daemons or other types of storage, you can move to our container storage, even to directories. Um, so we, we basically we built uh, these uh, two different libraries along with the OCI specification, and we have all the building blocks we needed to, to basically uh, wrap them with a the daemon. So Cryo um, basically takes advan full advantage of using container storage for storing its data, containers image for pu pulling images uh, from different registries in different locations. And then we use run C and um, we support using run C uh, to run the containers underneath us, which is exactly the same thing that the Docker daemon does. So if you, run, if you look to the Docker daemon now, you'd see that all containers are actually being launched under run C. Um, but we've also worked with, in our uh, OCI effort, clear containers, which is an Intel um, um, sponsored effort, Clear Containers is running uh, containers inside of virtual machines. Um, it's said it's tied to lightweight VMs. And so we've been working hand in hand with Intel to make sure that Cryo works uh, well with uh, multiple different uh, container runtimes. So right now we do run C and Clear Containers um, and others have, have looked into potentially using it. So next slide. Yep. Uh, so the, the, re the remaining components are the OCI runtime tools. So Dan mentioned that we need a spec file, a spec config.json file for running a runc container and a root of this. So the generate library in the OCI runtime tool is used to generate these configurations. And the advantage is this, it's used by all other projects and it has all the latest bug fixes. So whenever there are any changes to the spec, we get the fixes in the generate library. And then for networking, we went with CNI, which is which has kind of become the container networking standard. And we use CNI to hook up networking for the pods in Cryo. And it, it, it tests with pretty much all the different plugins. We have tested with Flannel, Weave, OpenShift SDN, and, and a few others. And the final, but like one of the most important bits there is Conmon. So the way uh, the OCI runtime is set up, there's a, there's a separate create and a start step and you need some kind of monitoring process 
to keep a hold of the container uh, container tty's and also like get its ex exit status and so on so kanban is used for like monitoring handling logs handling tty serving attach attach is like when you can do a keep or attach and attach to the tty of the container and also detecting and reporting out of memory conditions so we'll see that in action shortly in the demo so this is what a pod looks like when using cryo so you have an infra container the infra container is optional and it, it is what holds the ipc net and pid name spaces that are shared by the other containers in the pod and we have made the infra container pluggable so you can select whatever you want you can take the default kubernetes pos container or potentially replace it uh, with a system d container so system d can take care of reaping zombies inside of your other containers in the pod and running on top of each container is conmon so conmon i mean even though we launch many instances of conmon conmon is written in c for like efficiency and it's it's very efficient in terms of cpu and memory usage it has just the minimum bits required to satisfy our, our requirements for logging and monitoring So this is what it looks like with clear containers. They have an additional shim process and an agent. So clear containers are actually based on VMs. So instead of uh, launching pure Linux containers, they are using v a VM as the pod container. And inside that, they then spawn other containers. And for the latest version uh, 3.0 that they're working on, they are also sw also switching to using lip container, which is the same library as runc for uh, for starting the containers inside their VM. So this is what the overall architecture looks like. So on the left you have the kubelet, and kubelet is talking to the cryo daemon using gRPC. Now uh, the kubelet CRI. Uh, defines two interfaces. One is the image service and the runtime service. So anyone that wants to implement the CRI needs to implement both of these services. And Cryo implements them both. And for the image service, we use our containers image library that Dan mentioned earlier. And for the runtime service, we use the other components like the OCI generate library, TNI for networking, and storage for setting up the root FS. So what storage really is doing is when you say, hey, I want a Redis base container it it takes the container from the image library and explodes it onto disk setting up copy and write and gives you the path to the root fs in your config.json which is then uh, passed on to the oci runtime run c in our case which is a default and on top you see two pods running with, with containers a b the infra container and conmon running on top of each of the containers So what is the status of the project? So all the Kubernetes node conformance tests are passing and they are run on each pull request to cryo. We merge the PR only if the test passes, so there are no regressions. We have all, additionally, we also pass all the end-to-end uh, -end tests in Kubernetes. All the CRI APIs have been implemented. If you want to try out cryo, like I would encourage you to go to kubernetesbyexample.com website and try out all the examples and they should work. Uh, we released the beta version a couple of weeks back, the 1.0 beta, and we are working on some uh, bug fixes. And after that, we'll be ready to release the final 1.0 version. We have uh, maintainers and contributors from Red Hat, Intel, Suzy, and many other companies. Like I think at this point, we are at over 50 contributors on GitHub. Then for for easy setup uh, of Cryo, we have integration with kubeadm. And so we have a few repos under GitHub Cryo org, where you can check out uh, check out one of the repos and I'll help you set up kubeadm and Cryo. Minikube integration is in progress and we also support mixed workloads. Now mixed workloads means that under the same Kubernetes deployment, you can have some pods that are running under runc and some others that are running under clear containers 
and we do that using annotations today so you you have something called as a trusted workload and if you if you want uh, if you have an untrusted workload then you would want to run it under a vm based container and that the clear containers implement for additional security So now let's move on to some uh, demos. Can you see my screen? Yes, it looks it looks great and the font's wonderful. Can I ask a quick quick question while you're in in here just around OpenShift? So this mixed workload thing does this um, mean that eventually OpenShift will be able to do mixed workloads as well? So uh, yeah, go ahead. Dan. Yeah, I would say uh, <laughs> this is so from a OpenShift origin point of view, uh, one of the reasons I mean, Intel's working very hard because they really want clear containers to run underneath OpenShift. So from an OpenShift origin point of view, I see this definitely happening. And um, when we move to cryo as a, as a back end. Um, so whether or not Red Hat will end up supporting it on top of RHEL um, is always a question. So that's that's something we're we're talking about a lot in, internally. Um, but right right now we can't make any statement about support for clear containers underneath RHEL. Um, but I definitely see this as being something that uh, will work very well in in a uh, OpenShift uh, on you know OpenShift Origin type environment. Awesome. Good news. And, and, and there are some additional challenges in, in the cube world on how to manage two different kinds of, yeah. uh, of runtime. So that those need to be worked out, whether they should be allowed on the same node or not, how how should they be scheduled, how are the resources yeah. calculated? So yeah. this is like a proving ground. So if people want to try out those ideas, they can use Cryo and yeah. hopefully it'll make its way to Kubernetes at some point. Yeah, one thing to think about when you're looking at clear containers also is is um, you really have to control, you have to run them on physical hardware because um, they are usual virtualization and most of the cloud vendors block um, virtualization inside of virtualization. So uh, clear containers is a great, I think it's the best solution for, for you know, running containers inside of VMs from a security point of view is awesome for giving you isolation. But the big hindrance again is that um, you know, you have it. They they have to run run on physical machines. They can't run on top of virtual machines at this point. Yeah, but we have a lot of people running OpenShift on bare metal too. So yep, that's, yep. And that can, that so case, that, it works real well, real well. Yeah. All right, demo time. All right. Um, so I have the cryo daemon running. So I'll just show it here. And then I started Kubernetes local cluster, pointing it to the cryo daemon. And now let's uh, get playing with it. I'm going to uh, start busybox container. And you can see that this works. So what this proves is that the attach API in the CRI is implemented correctly. So we spawn a busy box container and then we are able to attach to the TTY of the container. Uh, so your, your shell is working just fine. Now let's try. HTTPD container. So it is still pulling the container. And it started. So you can see that this is all running under RAMC. You see that the first two are stopped, which is a previous container that we had started. And now we see two running containers. One is for the pause and others for HTTPD. Let's do a get pods again. And let's see if we can call it. 
So this shows that CNI integration is working because we can reach the pod. Let's try to get the logs of this container. So you can see the three entries for the three times that we called the pod. And now let, let's actually take a look at what's happening underneath the covers. We got, we got two Run-C containers running, one for the POS container and the other for the HTTPD container. And we also have Conmon running. And you can take a look at this by taking, so we, we use the system DC groups here. So let's see what's happening in those files. So here you see uh, uh, the C group that is set up for the container. And we also have a C group that is set up for the conmon that is running on top of the container. And you can notice that both of these are running under the same slice. So they are getting charged to the pod slice here, which is cube pods best effort pod something something dot slice. And we can also take a look at the PS3 of Conmon to see how the processes are set up. Conmon is the parent of the HTTPD inside the container. And it's monitoring and supporting logging and attach and all those features. Let's try to exec into this container. So you got your exact working, we can exec. So that, that's one more CRI API. So you can go in there and debug your container. So that, that covers like all the features in, uh, in CRI. Now let's take a look at how, whether this works with OpenShift as well. Now OpenShift shifted to the CRI in version 3.6. So we can actually replace the runtime under OpenShift to make it talk to Cryo. So what I what I've set up here is an OpenShift uh, local cluster with Cryo as the runtime. And let's uh, try some OpenShift features. So let's do OC get pods. Only the router is running right now. And we can try and Create a pod. So we just started the Hello OpenShift pod. Let's create a service for that pod now. Hello service. And the route. Let's try to reach it. See, so the router is working fine. We can reach uh, this pod using the router and the host header. Also, this one more example to show the integration working. It's thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, the last minute restart didn't help. All right. Uh, yeah, the demo gods went with us. Mm -hmm. this one. <laughs> <laughs> we 
wouldn't be a live demo if we didn't have something. Yeah, yeah sorry cool. about that. No, so if, if you want to take a look at uh, more demos, we have links to a couple of more ASCII namers where we have uh, a demo of showing the cube ADM and mixed workloads and also a multi-node, multi-OS cluster. So we, we show it running on Debian's and Ubuntu's and on different OSs. Awesome. And now I'll hand it over to Dan. Okay, so uh, one of the one of the problems with this, uh, you know, everybody that's using uh, Kubernetes right now, um, on top of uh, Docker Daemon, uh, a lot of people like to go in and sort of uh, debug around or figure out what's going on. So um, unless you have the the knowledge that. Uh, um, Ronald has right now going in and executing those run C commands and trying to match what uh, um, what Kubernetes is doing to what actually is going on in the system, or if the daemon for some or the, the container runtime for some reason gets hung up, how do you, how do you debug situations? Um, so most people right now are actually using the Docker CLI um, to do that type of activity. So you know, show me what images are running, uh, allow me to kill con uh, containers, um, you know, um, different types of activity. So we decided that we wanted to build um, sort of a, a simple interface um, on the back end um, of uh, basically behind uh, Cryo. And now since Cryo is using container storage and containers image um, and actually storing all its data on disk and putting its locking and stuff on disk, we could actually build up a, a command line interface to actually interact with uh, basically the storage and the images and, and be able to look at everything that's going on. Um, so we started building a tool called called KPod, so, if they, um, so it's a management tool for containers and images, um, and it's daemonless, so you don't, even have to, you don't even have to run the cryo daemon to, to be able to use this, um, so if the cryo daemon's hung or shut down or whatever, you can still go in and look at storage and look at what the containers and pods are running in the environment. Um, so the other th thing we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that it was uh, easy for users to transfer the knowledge. So if you're going, if you go from a Docker um, backed Kubernetes and you go to a, a cryo based one, uh, we wanted to make it simple for you to, to um, uh, transfer the knowledge. So we're really basing the um, uh, KPods, at least the initial version of KPods is, is matching the Docker CLI. So um, if we go to the next slide, we'll show you where we are, where we are in, stat, uh, in development of the KPod uh, CLI. So these are some of the commands um, that we've implemented so far. This is actually up on, if you go to the Cryo, Kubernetes Incubator Cryo project, you'll, you'll find uh, on the README that we list out um, all of the uh, KPod commands that are currently implemented. And this picture was taken as of yesterday. Um, so you see that we have, um, you know, sort of a lot of the image stuff based stuff that's available in Docker. So if you know how to do it, Docker images, um, um, you'll be able to just, you know, switch out the Docker command for KPod images. Um, and pretty much all of the uh, options and things like that remain the same. Um, so we've implemented uh, probably about th uh, half to three quarters of all the interfaces and we're uh, for KPod. Um, at this point to match the entire Docker CLI suite. Um, obviously, we're not implementing things like Swarm and other other parts of it, but pretty much everything everybody's familiar with um, we're implementing in KPod. And again, it's it's not daemon based. So when you do a KPod run, uh, the container will be a child of you. You're not going out and doing a client server operation to talk to a centralized daemon to do it. Um, so you'll be able to do KPod exec to get into a container and you'll be able to do KPod PS to show you all the containers that are running. Um, uh, so the first phase is, uh, is to implement uh, most of the Docker CLI, um, but we're also implementing some other interesting tools in here. So if you look down about halfway, you'll see a KPod mount. And what KPod mount can actually do is mount up the container. So you can actually get the mount point of where a container is. And, and um, so, so you can actually start to uh, fool around with the container. You can actually just go to the directory and look at what's inside of the container. You can actually copy stuff into the container. You can copy stuff out of the container. Um, and you can use any tool you want to um, 
interact with the container. So you can use external tools on the machine to m manipulate data. Um, so we're looking to enhance um, sort of the, the sort of the Docker CLI experience um, by taking advantage of some of the other tools. Um, eventually, right now, KPod is, is really about managing containers. Um, but the next phase, um, after we've completed the Docker CLI, uh, we want to actually get into management of pods. So, um, you know, how do, how do I launch a pod? How do I add a container to a pod? How do I remove a pod? Um, also looking at things like, um, you know, sort of the management, you know, how to, we want to experiment on how management of pods happen. So can I set up pods in such a way that um, if I have two containers in a pod, what happens when one container dies? Does the entire pod shut down or does the container management tool restart? So we're looking, we're in, in investigating and thinking about um, things more, more at the pod level than the containers. But at, at least in the beginning, we want to make it easy to transfer knowledge across um, from um, the Docker CLI to the KPod CLI. Um, next slide. So at this point, we're going to uh, just conclude, and uh, why don't you take over, Ronald? Uh, yeah, so the next step is it's releasing 1.0, just making sure that everything works fine. There are no bugs. We are doing some testing, so hopefully we'll have the 1.0 out in two to two, three weeks. And then we want to graduate out of the Kubernetes incubator, meet whatever the requirements are over there for graduation. And uh, post 1.0, we'll be, we'll be changing our, our tactic around how to be version cryo. So we'll be versioning it to match the Kubernetes version. So it's very simple for someone to understand what version of cryo works with what version of Kubernetes. So we'll have Cryo 1.7 working with Cube 1.7, Cryo 1.8 working with Cube 1.8, and so on. And also, we are working on integrating Cryo and targeting it for OpenShift 3.7 and getting it onto OpenShift Online. Well, cool. So we have a blog uh, on medium.com slash cryo where we have been blogging quite frequently about the new features that we add to cryo and you can follow us on github talk to us on irc and take a look at the website uh, the contributions are welcome feedback is welcome any help with testing is super super welcome awesome well there's a couple of questions in the chat so um let's let's get those answered if we can um the one regarding kpods how does something like kpods ps know what containers are running if there are no central if there is no central daemon um where you know, to track of good one well it, basically what's happening is uh, at any time cryo starts a um starts a container um that that uh, it basically puts down the information onto disk. So the so we're using so the central store for information about what containers are running or are being stored on disk, um, as well as um, you can also query for Run C. So we can figure out uh, you know Run C also can keeps track of which containers are running on the system. So uh, if you look at uh, one one of the issues I always had with the Docker daemon is that all this information is being stored and hidden away inside of the Docker daemon, um, and that therefore if the Docker daemon crashes or whatever there's a chance that you could lose information but we've moved all the locking and and the um and the status information is actually being stored on disk so we can interact with the, the with the data the same way that um, uh, cryo did we're actually making a new library call we're calling it live pod um, we're working on that now but by the way kpod and live pod are not blocking cryo so uh, cryo is probably going to get released to 1.0 before we've completed all of kpod so um, but basically we we're looking at building out a you know, pure library so that others can interact with the, the data stores and stuff that Cryo is using. Yeah. So um, someone earlier, Siraj, asked earlier, um, and it might be a topic for a, another OpenShift Commons briefing, but how do you set up an OpenShift cluster with Cryo as the back end with K8? Uh, K8 every time I see K8, so with Kubernetes, are there flags you can change when you do that? Yeah, so right right now, uh, like just a couple of weeks back, a pull request was merged into OpenShift Ansible. And basically, you just pass set an environment variable uh, to tell it to use Cryo, and it'll do the right thing. Uh, oh. If you want to, I, I can quickly show you what uh, what uh, what we do. 
And the other, the other thing, uh, Munral, is there's a typo in your URL um, for um, the word incubator. So someone has just pointed that out. Sure, <laughs> we'll fix that. All right. Uh, so if you want to like to answer the question about uh, setting up cryo, you just go into your node config and uh, and pass this these uh, these arguments to the kubelet, the container container runtime, the runtime endpoint socket, CRI. There's like four or five things you need to pass. So this is the stanza that you need to pass, and then OpenShift starts talking to cryo. It's really that simple. Wow. So we don't need a whole OpenShift Commons briefing on it. That's yep. great. Yep. Is there documentation for that uh, yet? Uh, so there isn't. So you can use Ansible, uh, OpenShift Ansible to to start an OpenShift cluster with Cryo, and I have another Ansible uh, script that's that builds everything from source and does this. But it will be good to get a blog out. So maybe we, one of us can write out a quick blog. So. Well, I'm also teasing out the question around documentation for all of this stuff too. So, because the documentation by blogging is is wonderful to get things started, but um, real documentation on stuff like this. And so, I'm i been pushing people to write stuff for the OpenShift doc set. So, we'll see if we can get that in there somewhere, so it's searchable. Um, Brad is asking one more question. Um, uh, what are the what are some of the types of workloads when you say mixed workloads? Okay, so um, basically, if you think about what what is the riskiest thing to run in your environment, um, you potentially you know, uh, if you've seen any of my talks in the past, I've always talked about uh, you know, virtual machine separation is better than container separation, um, and there's, there's several reasons for that. But the main one is that the the kernel is a single point of failure between, you know, that if there's an issue in the kernel, there's potential breakout. So if you're going to run um, certain, you know, really dangerous workloads, workloads that really require heavily privileged um, operations to happen inside of your containers, then um, and, and those workloads, you're probably better off putting them inside of a virtual machine. Um, so using something like clear containers for that would be helpful. Uh, one thing we've thought about um, is sort of the, the you know, it, it, would we be able to do something like OpenShift builds? Um, so if you think about you know, people pulling down random uh, internet packages and building and running random code, um, that might be something that we, we want to put inside of a virtual, you know, add the security of a virtualization wrapper around it. Um, but I mean, you, you know, it goes back and forth. One of the problems with uh, some like layer containers is that you start to lose, you start to get, you know, better separation, but you, you know, you lose access to certain things on the host. So there's there's, there's pluses and minuses to, to using uh, VM uh, isolation as well as uh, using standard containers. So I think it really, you know, it, it's up to you, but um, I, I like to have the ability to have choice. Ah, uh, let's see. Um, I think that was the last question, if anyone else was going to. Um, uh, yes, Michael has and was, that was directed at you around getting the docs if you're. <laughs> It's a pet peeve of mine. We tend to blog, but uh, document by blogging and um, trying to get it into the doc set is one thing that I'm trying to move us forward on. And, and Mike says, yes, he'll, he'll do both. Awesome. Um, seeing is the other thing, um, this you said this was targeted but for 3.7 of OpenShift. And um, so that by the time we get to the OpenShift Commons gathering in December, hopefully we'll be able to. Um, show it off a little bit more and hope, um, we'll have Dan and, and Monroe there at the gathering, which is the day before OpenShift Commons. Um, and we may have, if there's new things that come up in between now and then, we may have you guys back. Here's one more question that's just come in from Ivan. What plans are there to have Cryo adopted in public cloud providers container services such as GKE? Um, right now, you know, right now with Cryo, we we tend to have a lot of people sniffing around the edges. So there's, you know, all the all the big players are, are taking a look at Cryo. Um, they're they're investigating it, and um, but we have no um, nothing we could talk about. Or, or nothing is actually solid as far as you know potentially adoption by uh, large cloud providers or anything like that. Um, 
but again, uh, our main goal is, is is to satisfy Kubernetes. You know, this we're basically saying cryo is the you know is a uh, slim down purpose built uh, daemon for running uh, Kubernetes uh, workloads, and you know so. Uh, in a perfect world, I'd love to see it uh, get adopted in uh, uh, in GKE, but uh, right now um, everybody's just looking at it. So it's it's one of those things where we can perhaps have the T-shirt that says um, Kubernetes, not just for containers anymore. Yeah. <laughs> we all thought uh, VMs, or I naively yeah. we thought VMs would go away, and uh, yeah. they're back. So this is wonderful, yeah. wonderful news for lots of us. Um, yeah. and people who are security minded. So I really appreciate all the work you guys are doing and um, all the collaboration that's going on across all of the different communities to make this happen. So. Yeah. So one of the things I like to do on Twitter is, is add, add a uh, trending of no big fat demons. Uh, <laughs> so, so. All right. Well, that's the yeah. T-shirt that we yeah. should no big fat Another demons. Another place that we're actually looking to integrate with, we actually have another um, part of this project, which is called Builder, which is a replacement for, so obviously Cryo doesn't do anything about building containers. Um, it's um, it's just for running Kubernetes and Kubernetes doesn't build container images. Um, so we've actually broken apart and used similar tools to build a thing called Builder. So that's uh, Builder, like I would say it. Uh, B U I L D A H, and um, you know, maybe we'll uh, we'll talk at the uh, OpenShift Commons about Builder and potentially integration between uh, OpenShift and Builder as a backend for building uh, container images and potential integration with sourced image. Yeah, I'm going to give you guys a half an hour slot there and, and make you talk and um, yep. do your thing. So um, I'm looking forward to that because there'll be lots of new stuff and um, interesting use cases as well. I'm sure. And if you're on um, this session and you are, you know, running on bare metal or you're thinking about using um, uh, Create Cryo, um, let me know and um, maybe we can get you there too and to, to share your use cases. So that would be great. So that's going to be December 5th in Austin, Texas, along with um, KubeCon, which will be the following day. So it's going to be lots of fun and we can listen to Dan's wonderful Boston accent um, <laughs> talking some more about Builder. So thanks everybody for um, joining us today. Uh, this should be up with the slides if um, Monroe sends them to me and the links uh, by tomorrow. And we will be um, distributing that on blog.openshift.com and uh, you'll see that go out on the Twitter. So thanks again.